Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emmeline Foster, and I'm the executive director of the French American Foundation in the United States. We are very happy to have you all for an important digital discussion. Today, we welcome Dr. Marcia Chatelain and Laurie Ferralen, both of whom are alumni of our Young Leaders program. One of the silver lining of the COVID-19 shelter in place is being able to assemble our leaders from all over the US and France together to share their expertise. We at the French American Foundation believe in building bridges between leaders and in learning from each other. We believe it is important to come together in time of crisis and tumult, and especially when discussion may be challenging. We do this because it is only by learning from one another that we can possibly move forward. In a second, Marsha and Laurie will dive in into the discussion on unrest, civil rights, capitalism, and America's past 50 years. Laurie will have the pleasure of introducing Marsha, and I have the pleasure of introducing Laurie myself, and it's not an easy task. Laurie Ferralen um, was the youngest member of the 1999 World Cup champion US Women's National Soccer Team. It took me a while to train to say that. Like, long <laughs> thing. So, over the span of her career, she was a World Cup champion, Olympic gold medalist, and Olympic silver medalist, and three times national champion at the University of North Carolina. She has been an athlete ambassador for Right to Play and show racism the red, the red card, and has worked with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. As part of her volunteer work, Lori has been active in the US State Department Sport Envoy Program since 2008 and has visited many countries to conduct diplomacy through sport with the goal of supporting the US mission abroad in the empowerment of women and girls. Laurie also has an actual job. She is the Chief Program Director for the Charlie Theron Africa Outreach Project, whose mission is to invest in African youth to keep themselves and their peers safe from HIV. After extensive field work living in rural South Africa, she joined the team based in Los Angeles and currently manages all grants the foundation makes to community-engaged organization in Southern Africa. I told you it was not an easy task. <laughs> I could have given you the quick and dirty, Emmeline. <laughs> that's important. We all need to know you were a, a <laughs> gold medalist. That's very important. Um, so, Again, thank you so much, Marsha and Lori. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emmeline. Um, thanks to the French American Foundation for hosting this really important conversation. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Marsha Chatelain. Um, she's a professor of history at Georgetown University. She's a 2015 young leader and author of two books, Southside Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration and Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. She's received awards from the National Endowment for Humanities and the Carnegie Foundation. Um, so welcome, Marcia. I'm super excited to have you lead this conversation. I know that it's been um, a really exhausting time for, for everybody right now. Um, I mean, amongst COVID-19, but we now have, we're at this, it seems to me like a very pivotal moment um, as individuals. And it, it feels a lot like people are paying attention now. Um, and the time's right to have this conversation. So I want to, I want to, I want to make sure that you have time. I know that you have some slides to show us and um, <laughs> some things to discuss. And then you guys, for, for all of you watching, if you want, if you have any questions or comments, just pop them in the Q and A down below. Um, and I'll do my best to filter through them all as quickly as possible and, and select some so that we can really get this discussion uh, going in depth. So Marsha, please. Thank you so much. And Lori, it's a pleasure to meet you. And as someone who watched um, women's soccer really um, grow and develop um, throughout my youth, I just say it's so exciting to um, see someone who's able to use their talents um, in athletics for the greater good. And so I hope that we get to connect after this experience. Um, Thank you everyone um, in the French American uh, Foundation community for joining me today. 
I was a young leader in 2015 and our U.S. fellowship took us to Denver, Colorado. And I remember that um, it was an interesting time to have visitors from France come to the United States because um, in that period of time, we had seen the emergence of the movement for Black Lives, which um, now we understand as a global force to question the excesses not only of police brutality, but the ways that poverty and racism and inequality have long shadowed um, people's lives and the quality of those lives. And I think that it's interesting to see the ways that Black Lives Matters, um, Black Lives Matter emerged in a particular moment and its relevance and salience um, in the moment that we are today. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my most recent book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, and expose the relationship between um, two forces that we often think as deeply disparate, and that is the movement for civil rights and the rise of fast food. And I'm gonna connect those dots to help us understand the centrality of urban unrest in both of these factors in US life and the way we see this articulated across the globe. At this time, I will share my screen and I will share my brief presentation. As a professor, I'm always in professor mode. So um, I hope you enjoy um, this presentation. So the reason why I decided to explore the relationship between the fast food industry and civil rights was because of a moment right before my fellowship. And that was in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri. For those of you who um, remember this moment, in August of 2014, an 18-year-old African-American man, Michael Brown, was shot and killed by a police officer named Darren Wilson. Brown's death ignited a series of protests and several nights of unrest in this community outside of St. Louis, Missouri, as well as across the country and across the globe. This was for the first time for many that people understood that Black Lives Matter was a decentralized protest movement that was questioning the ways that racism hampered the life of African Americans. While Black Lives Matter wasn't invented in Ferguson, their presence in Ferguson, Missouri helped globalize a movement to really think critically about how much progress has and has not been made in the United States. Now, this image, I think, really captures the complexity of the relationships between civil rights and capitalism and unrest in the United States. And it is an image of a McDonald's restaurant, which there are millions of fast food restaurants around the world. And McDonald's is probably one of the most recognizable US-based brands. But in this night uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, you see that the police and protesters are assembling in this one place. And after the uprisings were quieted down in Ferguson, many people wrote articles about this McDonald's restaurant. It was one of the few businesses that was able to remain open during the unrest. And some people analyze this moment in terms of even if you are opposed to fast food because of the nutritionally poor value of their food and you question their labor practices, that this McDonald's actually stood as a beacon of hope during this unrest. This was a curious image to me because as someone who studies the history of African Americans and capitalism, this scene in 2014 was not very different from this scene in 1968 in Washington, DC. In Washington, DC, as well as other cities across the country, after the assassination of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., cities erupted in protest and uprisings like this. And the cause of many of the uprisings that the United States experienced in the 1960s was because of violent confrontations with the police or reactions to a lack of movement in terms of response to violence toward African Americans. Now, these two scenes are linked because it was in 1968 that the McDonald's Corporation made a concerted effort to enter African American communities. And the reason why they did that is because McDonald's is a franchise and it depends on independent 
franchise owners to operate restaurants in local communities. After 1968, many white franchise owners were concerned about the safety of their property and their businesses in inner city communities. So McDonald's gave them an opportunity to move out of the cities and into the suburbs and replace them with African Americans who were interested in entering business. The reason why this move was so impactful for African Americans, it started a moment in which you started to see the presence of fast food in Black communities and then the hypersaturation of fast food in Black communities. One of the concerns that has been uh, talked about in news media about COVID was the ways that African Americans and Latinos have been affected by the virus because of pre-existing health conditions that are tied to diet and nutrition. But one of the things that people rarely connect the dots when they talk about race and nutrition is that part of the reason why so many fast food restaurants are in inner city communities is because the federal government and mainstream civil rights organizations endorsed fast food entering communities after major uprisings in the United States. So shortly after the uprisings in April of 1968, you saw scenes like this from Chicago in which people would put signs that said Soul Brother or Black Business in their business windows to prevent being targets of violence. If you have been keeping up with the news coverage in Minneapolis, you see similar signs, Black owned business or please don't target, we are a Black business. The reason why this becomes pretty powerful is because during uprisings throughout the United States, when they occur in African American communities, people are often concerned about these businesses. But one of the things that's often missing in the discourse is that if you look at a hyper segregated African American neighborhood, most of the businesses are not black owned. And if you look at the apparatus of fast food, you see that even if there are African Americans in the franchise business, it doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of African American economic life is enhanced by it. And this becomes important because after this moment, McDonald's leads the way for the fast food industry to infiltrate black communities. Signs like this from Chicago that commemorate the first African American franchise owner, as well as news articles from the 1960s often celebrated the arrival of McDonald's in black communities. Articles like this often recognized black people in the fast food industry as heroes, as um, trailblazers, as people of great influence and power. And although the wealth that was created through black ownership of McDonald's was helpful in creating philanthropies and supporting black organizations, at the core of the question of this approach to responding to uprisings is what is the role of business and what is the role of capitalism in actually responding to the reasons why people are so upset in the first place. If you look at the history of the various reports that are assembled after major uprisings in the United States, going all the way back to the 1919 race riots, different commissions would ask people, why are people so angry? Why did we have this moment of eruption? And they often said, we erupted in violence because of police brutality, because of inadequate housing, because of a lack of access to jobs, because of overcrowded schools, and a lack of access to medical care. But what's fascinating about these moments, whether we're talking about 1919 or after these uprisings end in 2020, is that for Black communities, they are more likely to get infusions of capital for business rather than substantive responses for these other problems. And this is the way in which I think that capitalism is presented as a solution to problems that are actually caused by capitalism. Because if we try to remedy the problems of police brutality with more black owned businesses, we ignore the dynamics of race and power that often lead to the kind of police violence that leads to these types of eruptions. Um, the last points I wanna make about this relationship is that throughout the history of uprisings in the United States after 1968. Um, McDonald's has been a force to try to 
create a narrative about the power of business to respond to communities. After the uprisings in Los Angeles in 1992, McDonald's sent a press release saying that none of its stores in South Los Angeles were targets of violence after people erupted on the streets when four police officers were acquitted in the killing of Rodney King. And they argued the reason why nothing happened to McDonald's was because they were a member of the community and they were deeply connected to African Americans. And this fallacy in thinking, I think, um, contributes to a narrative that business, and sometimes business alone, can be the vehicle or the mechanism for responding to the problems that people are expressing during these uprisings. And so I think that as we look at the period after 2020, after this moment resolves itself, we have to think about these connections about the quality of Black life. When Michelle Obama was leading her initiative around childhood nutrition and obesity and health, it has to be met, this demand for better health, with a demand for um, fairer and higher wages for people in the fast food industry, because we see the intersections of all of the social problems that contribute to unrest when we look at the lens of fast food. We look at a healthcare crisis that is also an economic crisis about the quality of jobs, and we also look at a landscape where so many civic and social problems are often responded to in terms of business and economic um, growth, when at times that kind of justice can only be delivered through serious measures that are taken on the part of um, civil society, the federal government, local communities, and leadership. And so I'm very excited about this conversation with Lori because I think that we often think about uprising and protest as just an extension of people's frustration with a single um, moment. But as we listen to the ways that protesters and movement leaders are talking about the complexity of this problem, we start to see the connections of a long history of protest and demands being met with the wrong solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia. This is, there's so many facets and elements to um, to your work and to this topic. And I want to, I guess, start off with, um, you know, taking it to the present day. But as far as, you know, business owners, and whether from corporate on down, in responding to it, I guess my biggest question is, because there are some business leaders, obviously, um, within the French American Foundation community, is how can they respond in a more meaningful way? I think that's a great question. Um, people often say, well, should there be no businesses or, you know, don't you want more black owned businesses? I want businesses to operate under regulations and under practices in which they are taking very good care of their employees. They're paying their fair share of, share of taxes so that they are not um, the vehicles to respond to social problems. And so what I mean by that is I am concerned that in the framing of Minneapolis, um, people are saying here are black owned businesses that you should support. And I think that's very important to support business. My concern is because of the vacuum that's caused in the allocation of resources, black owned businesses aren't just businesses, they become the unelected um, leaders and mediators for community because people can't get their resources. McDonald's um, that are franchised by African Americans are sometimes the only place where people can get health screenings. This is a failure of society. McDonald's is in the business of cooking hamburgers and serving it to people. I'm fine with that. But any time an owner of a business has to start providing health care outside of insurance, um, any time a business is only is one of a handful of places where people can register to vote, any time a business has to support sports for youth in schools or extracurricular activities or replicate the services of a senior center. You know, in some communities, McDonald's is the only place where children can play in a playground or seniors can meet and talk with their friends. That's the type of thing that um, upsets me. And so business um, people have been very generous. They have contributed to a great deal of philanthropy. But the reality is, is that the role of business is to advocate for policies to make sure that the state is using all of our collective resources for the greater good. 
I'm, I'm so glad you said that um, in part because, you know, we know that the things that um, that the private sector are really good at is capitalism and the the things that the the really complex problems that um, that need to be solved um, are really civil society, the public sector's responsibility, government um, and the public sector, the rest of the public sector. And it's not because, cap, you know, business, the private sector can't. It's because one, um, they won't. <laughs> they might they might not be able to, but they won't because there's not money in it. Um, and so I think you bring up a really good point about business owners and the power that they have to influence policy. Um, and you've seen it time and time again from these big ones. But as far as sort of the smaller players go, I think what's important about this is change doesn't always happen at the national level. Um, a lot of the changing, in particular with policing, um, a lot of those changes can be made at the state and local level, which is where these smaller businesses may have some more power. So can you maybe dive into a little bit about specific ways to advocate? So one of the things that I think is really illuminating in this moment is that if six years ago, um, someone who was with a Black Lives Matter group said, we are all about abolishing police. People get very scared about this idea. What if, you know, what, if, what happens if we don't have police? What's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? And when they talk about the abolition of the police, if you really dig deep into the thinking, it's about how much of the public resources should be put into specific acts, right? And so in Los Angeles yesterday, it was amazing when they were talking about the, the city's budget and there were calls to cut 100 million to 150 million dollars in policing. These are not radical ideas that say, well, we should have um, you know, a lawless state and people can do whatever they want. What they're asking is, if we have municipal budgets and whether it's in a big city like Los Angeles or in a small town where so many resources are going into policing, what is not getting funded and what are the ways where police start to take on roles that are inappropriate? So in the same ways that I don't think businesses should be paying for health screenings, I also don't think police officers should be the first line of contact when a person needs a social worker or a person needs medical care or when a person has a mental health crisis. The problem is, is that in cities across the United States, so much money is put into policing that the resources then of the police become the richest ones to solve problems. And so I think that business owners using their influence to say, we have security concerns. How do we meet them in a way that is designed not to criminalize our customers or community? How do we create relationships with city council so that when we are watching the budget, we're not just watching for small business grants, we're also watching how much money gets put into policing at the expense of services for those without homes, those who are hungry, and for public schools. And so the public consciousness about not only spending on policing, but one of the gifts that the Ferguson uprising brought us is that people started to learn in the United States that in a small town like Ferguson is not a big place, you can get equipment from the Department of Defense, equipment that wasn't used in Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere around the world, and you can bring it into a small town police force. And that's why you have tanks in front of a McDonald's. This is ridiculous. And so I think that the educational value of seeing what these protesters are arguing for and really listening to their vision helps us rethink these relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, and as far as Los Angeles goes, so I know that the, they were talking about 100, $150 million budget cuts to the police force. Keep in mind, their budget is $10.8 billion. Um, I would imagine that a lot of those line items are military grade um, weapons and protection. Um, but that's the questions that we have to ask. What is policing? Is it to protect and serve or is it the militarization of our um, police and so I, I definitely think keeping an eye on that and, and especially the budget as this moral document of where your priorities lie. What are you investing in um, as the government of your taxpayer dollars? Um, and so I, I have, sorry, go ahead, Marcia. Oh, I just want to say something about also budgets. Um, the other thing, this has been um, something that's been a little confused because what will happen at the end of these uprisings is that you will see more money allocated to policing and 
It will be put in line items that say maybe diversifying the police force or community policing. But those programs since the 1960s have not really worked in reducing police violence or increasing accountability. In 2014, people thought that body cameras were gonna be the answer. And then police officers would turn off the body cameras. And then everyone thought, okay, it's de-escalation. But if you have de-escalation and chokeholds are still allowed, then you can't see these different things. So I think that at each stage, um, we see more sophisticated new ideas. And on the other end of it, after these communities are in the process of rebuilding, we have to be vigilant that they aren't just rebuilt by the national chains like McDonald's, because the way that McDonald's was able to enter African American communities was using federal programs that were minority business set-asides to create minority businesses, but there's a very different um, impact on the community when the minority-owned business is a McDonald's versus a bookstore or a child care center. And those are the businesses that have a harder time accessing the capital through those programs. So, um, Marcia, we have uh, a couple of questions in our chat. And um, somebody had referenced, uh, Ricky, thank you for your question, last Friday during the looting and smashing of all the storefronts in Atlanta, same with here in Los Angeles, the video showed apparently looters protecting a Waffle House from damage. And Atlantans in particular um, share our pride in our hometown restaurants like Waffle House and Chick-fil-A. So restaurants and businesses can be places of collaboration and unity. And the question is, what is the role of local businesses to, to solve those divisions, solve today's divisions? Yeah, I, t I, got a, I got a real kick out of seeing that video because um, those are those scenes that, you know, McDonald's claimed happened all over Los Angeles in 1992. That wasn't entirely true. But there can be uh, moments where people feel very protective of those businesses. And it is a divide between national and local because nationally, Waffle House has been involved in racial discrimination lawsuits. Um, Chick-fil-A has not always had the kind of best image. But on the local level, if you have managers and wait staff and um, you know, a culture of accepting people, of not discriminating inside the restaurant, then it does make a difference. Um, I think that we have also seen an incredible shift in the history of uprisings in the number of businesses that have issued statements that say, yes, my business has been vandalized, but no property is more important than black life. And I have really been heartened by that because if a person were to say my business was destroyed and therefore I am not interested in this movement, that used to be a really socially acceptable thing to say. But I think that we have reached a breaking point in this particular moment that we have seen the ravages of COVID-19 and the inequality that that has exposed. And we have seen this constant struggle for people to say, you know, can we imagine a different way of ensuring the safety of our communities? And what it has resulted in is people who have been most affected by this damage being really clear that um, their priorities is amplifying black life. Now, the cynical part of me, the historian part of me will say that I think those responses are also a result of the fact that a number of businesses have been affected by shutdowns as a result of COVID. And in similar ways in the late 1960s, some business owners and some landlords were able to benefit from insurance payouts rather than having to rebuild businesses. I'm not saying that this is all cynical, but we also have to look at the economic protections that are put on some businesses, not the smaller ones sometimes, but um, that complicates um, the narrative. All of this is to say that I think those statements are very important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great. And the other thing is, I, for me, what is, I think, most poignant today is this need for a larger reckoning of the past, of um, the past racism. Um, and it kicked off, obviously, with, you know, when Eric Holder issued that searing report of Ford Ferguson, it was, it wasn't just about Ferguson. It yeah. was about every single one. And I know that in for example, in Chapel Hill, the police department immediately, they did a third party assessment of their policing um, and in specifically looking at racial biases. And what they found in the report was not good. And when the police chief, you know, he took it to, to his bosses and said, we need to do something about this and we also need to make this public, like total transparency. And there were a fair amount of people um, 
who control the police force that wanted to sweep it under the rug. Um, and he fought back and he said no. And till, you know, using that report, he really said, okay, now we're going to change our policing. So they decided to, for example, um, let little, little infringements, if you, you know, if you're pulling people over and you find some marijuana, some weed, let them go. Like mm -hmm. it, it's that discretion of a public administrator and the power to use that discretion to carry out the law, but carry it out in a way that, that it's, you know, you're actually protecting and serving the community and you're not trying to target people because of their race and being so, super aware of it. Um, so those changes that they made was really a welcome thing for, you know, first of all, because they knew that the report, I mean, his argument was, look, do you want this report to come out leaked and then explode? Or do you want us to come out right out in front of it and say, these are our biases in our police force? Um, and I think that was really powerful as a leader for him to do that. Um, but it brings a part that, you know, brings about this like acknowledgement of the past and where that comes from and then how we can get through it whether people argue that that's reparations, whether obviously changing in the policing, um, the systematic racism, how to recognize biases. And people are really searching for uh, resources right now, not just to educate themselves, but like, for example, when you're talking about budgets, one of the questions in the chat box is where can citizens go to find where taxpayer funds are being allocated as it relates to the increase of funds due to social uprisings. That's one question. The others is what are these resources that you can recommend for people that want to educate themselves um, on the American Civil Rights Movement, but also the history of racism. I have a few in my toolbox, but would love to hear what you think. Well, I think that there's two different goals here. And I think that sometimes they get a little confused. Um, on one hand, there are a lot of people who want to deal with the interpersonal kind of relationship stuff that makes them uneasy. So, you know, uh, and, and this is where I start to get a little grumpy. It's like people want books about race, but do they want indictments or do they want just books about race? Because books about race are often about putting a context to a set of relationships that are, are troubling. So there's someone at work and you can't kind of get over these things and you read these books, that's fine. But I also recommend books about mechanisms that have been used to control and to, um, to oppress in the clean ways. Because we can say that a police officer ending someone's life is wrong. We can, most people will agree on that. But are most people able to say, then perhaps we need a higher tax base so that the police don't have so much power in communities. Or we need to really think about immigration policy in ways that don't separate um, newcomers into our, our state, or we need to rethink our mythologies about history. We need to rethink who our statues are to, right? So those are two different things. And so I just, at this point, I just ask that people spend some time learning um, independently by themselves, because I think that there can be a performance of, of will, but when it comes down to it, I think everyone has to ask them, themselves a fundamental question. What am I willing to live without so someone else can have more? And I think that in the United States, in our context, um, because we are such a, a low tax kind of culture, that thought is actually quite revolutionary. And for our French colleagues um, and our colleagues throughout Europe, um, the diff the, it's a different set of questions. And it's, a, it's questions about identity and belonging, but they're both intertwined in this idea of recognizing how much power we have as individuals and what we are willing to relinquish. And I think this becomes really challenging. Um, the last thing I'm gonna say about policing, because I think this is such an important point, um, I oscillate between thinking that who's president matter, that, that the president matters and then doesn't. And then we, you see this calamity we have in the United States now, and I'm saying, okay, the president really matters. The president matters because, although the Obama administration didn't radically upend um, policing, there was at least an attorney general who believed in civil rights as a concept. And at least there was some type of pressure on police forces like the Baltimore Police Department and a consent decree that said, you cannot violate people in such extraordinary ways anymore. And the second that the Trump administration came in, they said that they would not enforce those consent decrees and they actually reinstated the program that brought military equipment into local police officers' offices. So, 
these things matter and um, I can send in the chat or I can send a link. Um, I worked on a project in 2017 about the Baltimore Police Department and their killing of a man named Freddie Gray. And in doing that history, um, I was actually shocked by the number of people who have been killed by that same police department in, um, in, 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 while in transport, that these are not new problems, that we just have different mechanisms today to actually communicate about it across um, the world. I think we have more questions. Oh, you're on mute, Lori. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, my kids have been knocking on the door, that's all. Okay. <laughs> real, real life in COVID times, right? Um, yeah, so the questions were around those, um, the taxpayer funds, where we can find that. Um, and I know that there are public documents. Uh, it's a good question for you because you've looked into it, obviously, um, in particular due to social uprisings. Is that just a timing thing of when you when you look at the response on the budget, that very next budget after the social uprising? You know, that's a great question because you can see um, something that's happening across the country. On the local level, the introduction, the introduction of new bills. So the number of um, local legislators who said, okay, I'm introducing a bill that chokeholds are no longer legal. I'm introducing a bill saying that if you have you know, certain types of violent offenses, you are off the police force. And so tracking those I think are really important because the announcement of the introduction of the bill doesn't mean that the bill is going to pass and become law. But also I think it's important to, um, Think about, yeah, so I think what we're going to see is in one year, the number of new programs that are introduced and the number of new ideas that are going to be designed to um, attract more business into places where there was some devastation in business and really think about what are the incentives. You know, after the Ferguson uprisings, um, Starbucks came into Ferguson, all of these new businesses said they were open. Ferguson didn't have a lack of businesses. It wasn't a place that was isolated without grocery stores and restaurants. It was a place in which there was a black population that was cut off from economic opportunities, cut off from high paying jobs. And so sometimes outside forces will say, we're gonna come in and we're gonna provide this. But I think that the real question is, well, is this exactly what we need? And, you know, since, 1968, we have seen this trend to say that when communities are devastated, they need businesses to provide jobs, but there hasn't been enough scrutiny about what kind of jobs, are they quality jobs, and what are the incentives, because often these incentives come in the form of tax breaks and other types of abatements to bring these employers, and it doesn't necessarily improve the quality of people's lives. Um, which actually brings me to civil society and I guess their role in all of this, and I'm talking not just in, um, in livelihoods in the time of COVID-19, but in particular right now among this, the, the divide in the country, um, how can we best support civil society? Um, we have to believe in it. That's first and foremost. When I talk to my students at Georgetown University and I say, if there was a problem in your community, how would you solve it? And 99% of the time, the students will say, well, we have to find sponsors right? Um, we, do, we live in the era of sponsorship, of public-private private partnerships, of corporate underwriting. It is the framework that most people are aware of, and I'm not suggesting that that isn't a viable path, but I am questioning whether or not we can imagine communities with the resources that are in front of them trying to solve problems without that type of approach. Everything can't be um, about seeing who will pay, but it perhaps is thinking about what do we have here that we have to reframe. And I think those exercises are actually really important because they remind us we have power. Um, the idea that the only way that we exercise our power is either through voting or protest, it leaves out a lot of people. And so I think that the first step is actually believing that we do have civil society, that we do have community, and the community has something to offer. And I think one of, again, the great lessons of COVID is that one of the biggest trends in responding to COVID has been mutual aid societies. As someone whose first book was on the early 20th century, mutual aid is not something that people talk about. And now I have 19 and 20 year olds telling me about they're part of a mutual aid effort. Mutual aid societies were 
largely used by African Americans and immigrant communities to try to help people out because they were dispossessed from, from state resources. And today, people are saying, well, we're not getting the COVID testing we, we need. We're not getting the food deliveries we need. How is our mutual aid society going to do that? And I think that we need to amplify this as the way that civic society actually has power within people taking care of each other to solve problems before we have to imagine that it's only at the grant cycle that we can start doing these things. Yeah, and and to your point, uh, so one of the, and I know, Katie, I think you asked about resources um, and for education. Um, civil society can also be those resources. So the Equal Justice Initiative is a really good one. Um, color of change. Um, also, President Obama hosted a town hall recently um, and really kind of brought to light some of the resources. There is also a toolkit on what you can do that he actually has released as well. We can try to put all these, um, maybe we could put them all in a sort of a list. I know that for people who are rather into, instead of reading, into watching things, 13th is an unbelievable documentary. Um, on the 13th Amendment, but also just the history. And it, it gives you a lens through which to look through racism, um, both overt and covert, as it moved through our history um, and how Black people were target, are targeted one um, thing in our people, society. Uh, ahead, one thing that people check. often ask is about like their kids. You know, How do you talk to your kids about this? Um, there's some really great um, children's books about uprisings particularly. But one thing that I think, especially since we're home for a while, hopefully for not too long, but hopefully we open up safely. Um, one activity that I think is really effective for white families to do is to do a history of where they live um, down to the point of their address. And one of the things that I have found really gratifying with that assignment is that um, it helps families really grapple with some of the ways that hypersegregation has shaped where they live or gentrification or removal by placing it within the context of one's home. Because it's very easy to say that there was a history of terrible things or terrible things happened in this place and not this place. But when we bring, um, when we bring the dynamics and politics of, of land removal, of theft, of violence, of slavery, of all of these types of injustice into the place in which we live, we have to grapple with not only history, but its, but its manifestation in our present life. And I think that that can be a very powerful way to talk about these dynamics um, in the context of a family, rather than um, what I think is sometimes feels more comfortable in which parents tell their children, um, you know, everyone's good, you should be nice to everyone. But I think, you know, what, what are the sacrifices and what are the consequences of our own privilege that rest within the very place we live? Marsha, I'm going to do that with my kids, although we just moved into a new place, but still doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I am going to do that with my kids. There's, uh, there are some really good kid resources. I think Sesame Street is also doing, they're doing a, a town, town hall, hall. Yeah, which is fantastic. Um, I was joking. I was like, this is the conversation about race that I wish I was invited to. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. I think um, my partner and I, he, he wants our kids to watch it. I think it's this Saturday. Um, or actually, I'm not sure. Saturday, Sunday, I'm on CNN. Thank you, Marsha. Um, yeah, Just Mercy also is streaming for free in June. Um, the story of um, Brian Stevenson, the founder of Equal Justice Initiative. Can I, can I say something about the movie that was shocking? Yes. So we screened yes. that movie early at Georgetown for our students, and Brian Stevenson actually came. Oh, and yeah. Um, I had to, I did the Q&A with him and I was so gut struck by this film because it did not, it did not um, sugarcoat or, or um, do a Hollywood rendering of the brutality of the death penalty in a way that I, I found really surprising. But there's something that Brian Stevenson said once on CBS News and it was the most kind of gut-wrenching thing that's ever been said um, in mainstream media. Um, he talks about his work at um, the museum in um, Alabama, which is essentially um, a memorial to people who have lost their lives in lynching and, and that form of, of organized violence towards African Americans in the United States. And someone asked him when the last lynching was. And he says the last noted lynching was in one particular year. And he said, then it went behind closed doors. It was called the death penalty. And he said this one thing on CBS Morning News of all places, and then the segment ended. And I thought about just the incredible power and clarity in making such statements. 
And I think for me, as someone who's sometimes put in the position to talk about things, whether it's in news or in a format like that, just how powerful it is to make clear the terms of the dehumanization and the terms of how violence is done. And I think about this increasingly um, as some of the news networks are making the decision to replay the footage of George Floyd losing his life, which I think is uh, not the best choice, but I, I, I think I kind of understand what they're trying to do editorially. But if we think about it in terms of, um, if I ask someone, would you pay a hitman to kill a stranger? You would say, oh my God, who would do that? And say, well, then why would we allow our, our funds, our public goods to be in a system where a person could take another person's life and there's no sense of accountability unless people beg for it. And I think that this is what is at stake right now. What are we willing to put money into? And if we can take that money back, what are we willing to do to, to try to undo that, that kind of harm? Yeah, he gets at that. I mean, and I think um, Just Mercy gets a little bit at, at the other side of it. But then, like you said, um, the discussion of modern day lynching, what that looks like and the dehumanization of black people. But that has been over the history of our country. Um, and with every single thing, whether it was the war on drugs or whether it was like you know, movies like Birth of a Nation, where the depiction of an angry black man is very different from the depiction of an angry white man. The fact that those guys can march, white people can march armed to Michigan, the Michigan State House. Um, and if that, if, if you can imagine that that group of people were black, do you think that they all would have been shot? Um, it, it's, it, it's incredible. And, you know, I also think that, you know, because we're all at home, or most of us are at home, um, we think, I think a lot about outsourcing and the fact that now, I, you know, I used to travel 30 to 40 times a year and now I'm home. So I'm cooking all of my meals. And I think about the fact that I am now, you know, doing more laundry, I'm doing more of the things that I had the privilege to outsource. And in many ways in America, racism can be outsourced to third parties to other vendors. So a person who would say, I would never take another person's life in order to do X, Y, and Z. We have entire mechanisms that are doing that for us and doing this on our behalf. And we have to take back that power. So we can't say, well, there's nothing I can do about low wages or I can, there's nothing I can do about the desperation that forces people in the middle of a pandemic out into the streets to beg for justice. I can't do any of it. And we're, we're outsourcing so much violence and harm that we can't be appalled that a police officer can do what they did to George Floyd and not be appalled by the fact that we can kind of sit and fund it and depend on it in order for our own kind of personal goals. And so this is an incredible, incredible moment. And I really, through all of the despair and all of the sadness, see it as this incredible gift to imagine other ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a, another question. Um, we may not have time to answer <laughs> answer it because it's a big one. It, it says, could you speak about the history of policing in the U.S. and how it helps us understand the present? Yes, I can. In, in the sense that um, one of the reasons why Ava DuVernay's by, uh, documentary, The 13th, was so resonant with people is that it talks about the fact that even with the abolition of slavery, um, the Constitution allows for an exception, and that is um, if a person is in, um, incarcerated, then they are not granted the same rights as a person who is, who is free outside of the system of slavery. This becomes important because even when slavery was abolished in the United States, there were policies and practices that allowed for people to be incarcerated um, with very little cause and then be brought into the labor force. So the rebuilding of the South after the end of the Civil War was all because of prison labor. And so whether it was the construction of the railroads, whether it's the harvesting of cotton, whether it is then later um, supporting industries like textiles or the development of um, the, the processes need, you needed for Coca-Cola, whatever it is, we have an entire workforce that is invisible and that is not um, does not have the same type of recourse as a person who is free. Once and they were and they were arrested for things like loitering, loitering, um, vagrancy, um, being yeah. lazy. 
um, defiance, all of these things. So anytime you have a system that's predicated on unfree labor, you are going to protect that system at all costs if it, it's beneficial to you. So all of that is to say then policing is all about the surveillance of people who may or may not be doing something and then having a system in which to remove them from the witness of society in order to abuse or harm them. Um, if you're interested in this, um, the podcast series that I did was called Undisclosed, The Killing of Freddie Gray. And we went, we did 16 weeks and my part was history of thinking about how Maryland goes from the abolition of slavery to the implementation of some of these practices. Modern day policing is about um, a distrust and surveillance of people based on characteristics that are supposed to be grounded in history instead of reality. It's about suspicion. It's about um, trying to prevent things that you're not sure is going to happen and then responding to things after they happen with the desire to punish rather than to um, allow for reflection or reform or change. And so we see these, we see these lines. And so I think this is why in this present moment, the calls to reform the police have not been as resonant as calls for things like defunding and disbanding because people are, I think, incredibly skeptical of undoing that history in order to improve policing because we've had about five decades of attempts to reform policing and they have not worked. I mean, does this, I guess, um, does this have to do with our needing to reckon with our past then? Yes. And we can't do it. I mean, this will be the impossible task, right? Yeah. You're going to start over and we're not going to be reflective. We're going to start over and we're not going to be reflective. Um, and I think that once people realize how many institutions have been designed to degrade and to eliminate and to, um, and to dehumanize, the more and more they will get creative. The creative energy that we have in this moment because of the tragedies of COVID and these uprisings is really unlimited, but we only tap um, that creativity if we're open to hearing different ideas and hearing from each other's, not just our ideas, but our fears and anxieties and look to each other to really respond to that. And we first need to learn to recognize where they are because some of them are very, like not what we'd expect, but then you're like, oh my gosh, I do that. Or I've seen people right. do that. And, and I'm not just talking about white people um, I'm because black people will do it to to themselves as well. It's not it, this is not like um, uh, only white people do it and black people don't. It's everybody. But being able to recognize it, I think, is the first step. Um, Julia has a really good question um, that I'd like to get to because I know we're running out of time. Um, do you distinguish between businesses and individual business people in analyzing the appropriateness of their advocating to the government to press for the sort of policy uh, policy changes you describe? For example, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company who might be on the board of an advocacy organization, the goals of which you would see as positive. Yeah, so that CEO, um, you know, thank you for doing your civic duty, be on a board. But I, I think it, it can ring really hollow if you are um, a CEO of a company and there's no, there's no mechanism for overtime pay, protections of, for workers who are sick, um, there's no um, taking seriously sexual harassment in the workplace. There's no diversity on your board. I mean, this is, I, Twitter is both the devil and the best thing in the world because all of these companies that were tweeting their solidarity in this moment and people were responding and say, well, I want to see a picture of your board. Or I used to work at this company and you didn't really celebrate diversity. And so I think that this accountability and this reckoning, because it's one thing to say that, as an individual, I want to do good. And I think it's something entirely to say, I'm an individual, I can never be perfect, but here are the things that I'm willing to grapple with. This is an incredible moment for the business community to actually be real leaders and say, you know what, how we were proceeding before has exacerbated inequality. So we are gonna take a step back and think about our policies and our practices. We're gonna think about our policies um, around hiring people who may have a criminal conviction record. We're gonna really rethink about our commitment to diversity because the, the tension that we find right now, and it's very much animated in my industry as someone in higher education, we have austerity as a result of COVID. We have job loss as a result of COVID. We have deep fear because of resource available, 
availability because of COVID. And then we also have an intolerable call for justice that requires financial resources and a real allocation of what we think is valuable. So we have a really good opportunity right now. So I think individual business people, like any people, can be in systems where they grapple with the inequality, but they can still try to move things forward. But you know, empty statements of solidarity, commitment to diversity, this will do nothing to undo the, the, you know, the real, the real um, intertwined and entangled way that we operate um, in the United States. Mm. Yeah, it's a values alignment thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, what you do in your in your own lives, in your own what you fight for, um, it needs to come through in your business practices, your budget as a moral yes. document. And we um, can admit when we're wrong. So yeah. we, I mean, cities across this country are in outrage because we live in a zero liability, no fault admitted culture. Have that police officer just humbled himself to say, I killed another human being and this was wrong. If that police department did not listen to their attorneys, weren't worried about their insurance policies and said, oh my God, this person did the wrong thing. And he had asked for mercy and forgiveness before the public sphere. I think that would have gone a really long way. But we live in a culture, and this is something that Brian Stevenson says, we live in a culture that's so punitive and based in shame that when we are wrong, we try to evade it instead of taking accountability. And this, these, the culture of evasion has caught up with all of us. And so now we all are in a position to say, you know what, those were some real missteps. I know more, and so I do better. And that's all we need. And I think that um, you know, we worried about the cost of litigation. We, we were worried about the cost of a lawsuit. The human toll that this moment has had on the people of Minneapolis and throughout the country is far higher than any type of fault or liability case that could have been involved in what happened in Minneapolis. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, for certain. I think, um, so yeah, I know we only have three minutes uh, left and Bama actually does a really good, um, there's some good questions coming in. I'm sorry that we have three minutes and, uh, actually one of which I do want to get to in reference to businesses. Thank you, Michael. Can you share your opinion of tweeters fact checking posture of the president and juxtapose that against Facebook stance of minimal involvement? I mean, God, it's <laughs> in 30 seconds. <laughs> I feel like the train has left the station for years. If day one, Americans with any integrity said no to this Donald Trump nonsense, we wouldn't be in this case. People, uh, people are a little late to that party. So yes, I appreciate Twitter finally taking responsibility that it is a platform that has information that has impact in the same ways that, you know, Facebook is trying to avoid this. I, I, I don't, I don't know what the interest is actually for Facebook for, um, for admitting kind of no responsibility. We take responsibilities for the things that we say. I can't say, I have the right to say things, but I can't say whatever I want and not feel like I don't have a responsibility. That's one of the greatest um, fictions of American life. I, I don't know if there's a similar one in France, but oh, Americans love the fantasy of free speech as if <laughs> we are free to do whatever we want and we have no responsibility. So I think um, shame on Facebook, and shame on Twitter because both of these outlets know that they have the capacity for harm because of the nature of the business that they're in. And they have to make a decision, right? Like we all have to make a decision about where the line is. Yeah, and sometimes it's gray, but sometimes it is very not gray. It's um, so clear. <laughs> it's so clear. And also to, to your point about that fallacy of our rights, um, our rights are not absolute. Um, they, if, if they infringe upon the rights of another, they are not okay. So you can't yell fire in a theater. Um, you can't wield your gun everywhere. You can't like, there's so many things that you cannot do. Um, and that's, that's, that leads to, um, the end of our discussion, which I'm so, I want this discussion to go on farther. Um, Bama, I do want to recognize that you were saying, could you please share Andrew Governor Cuomo's call for a moment of silence at 2 PM to honor the memory of George Floyd. That's um, a beautiful place to end. Yeah, thank you guys so much for this. Um, Emmeline, if you, I mean, if you guys have more questions, please send them in. I'm available. Um, yeah, and thank you guys for all being here. It was a real pleasure. Marsha, um, you are amazing. <laughs> we will connect afterwards. 
and thank you to Emmeline and Val from French American Foundation and everybody for joining us today. Um, really important conversation. Please, let's try and take this forward. Bye, everyone. Thank you.